say, can you see by the dawn's early light? But so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight Oh, the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets brought glare The bombs burst That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave Oh, the land of the free America is more than a place. It's a promise, which we strive daily to realize. And when our politics veers away from that promise, Nobody likes me. it is our solemn duty to stand up and demand better. Now is that time, and the Convention on Founding Principles is our chance. Thank you for joining this movement to chart a better, more principled way forward for the nation. Good evening, I'm Sir Michael Singleton, and I'm so excited to be here with you tonight to begin night two of the Convention on Founding Principles. For those of you with us last night, we hope you enjoyed the stark differences between the voices headlining this convention and those on stage at the RNC. And to show our new friends tonight, as the Washington Post so aptly put it, Republicans are putting on two conventions this week, and one of them is saying, and well, folks, welcome to the SANE convention. Tonight, we take our inspiration from Abraham Lincoln, we're talking about what it means to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's one of the most definitive aspects of the American experiment that we govern ourselves. We fill the halls of power, we choose our leaders, and we ensure that they work for us. But that basic principle of self-governance is being chipped away by corruption, manipulation, cronyism, and lies. But before we get to our speakers, I want to bring in Mindy Finn and Heath Mayo. So guys, and I, I wanna go to you first, Heath. So this is an interesting stat here. The Republican convention drew 15.9 million viewers, down 28% in 2016, according to Nielsen reports. Why do you think that is? And I just wanna get your overall assessment of what we've seen from the RNC so far. Yeah, well, I'm sure the president won't be too, uh, too pleased with those ratings, uh, but it goes to Michael to the fact that people are just not taking the Republican Party seriously anymore. There's a large swath of the electorate uh, in the in the middle, uh, really. In the, even even now in the right of center, we're seeing more Republicans get frustrated with the party, frustrated with its lack of credibility on issues that it said that it cared about. Issues like the Constitution, the separation of powers, debt and deficits. They've completely blown through uh, the national debt. It, it's it's at all time highs right now. And so I, I think that's what you're seeing is just some apathy and frustration with anything that the party is saying. And that's a real hit on its credibility. But you asked about he, the convention itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think the speeches last night were telling. I didn't get to see all of them, but I saw a few. And let me just say, Kimberly Guilfoyle, that speech from her, I don't I couldn't even follow it, quite frankly. I mean, it was loud. It was obnoxious. It was angry. And it really didn't communicate any kind of hope for the country. It was just all death and destruction if Trump doesn't win. 
And that I think the American people just see completely through at this point. I mean, that that maybe worked in 2016. I can't imagine it working again. Uh, but I w do want to point out one thing, because we are focused on ideas and principles here. I want to commend Senator Tim Scott on his speech. Uh, he delivered excellent remarks, I thought, very focused on the substance, on the principles of what you know, of opportunity. I think that was, if you could sum it up in a word, that is what he was talking about. Opportunity zones, the importance of a quality education in this country. Those are ideas that can win, that Americans do believe in, that they want to support. And to hear him talk about those things in the context of his personal story about striving in this country was really inspiring to me. And I think he only mentioned Trump once. And, uh, you know, he said that it wasn't about Trump, that it was about ideas. So I wanted to commend him for that. But th those are my thoughts, Shermichael. So, so Mindy, in thinking about Senator Tim Scott, there was also another sort of star, if you will, of the night, and that was former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. According to most analysts, they believe those two gave the more traditional speeches, if you will, of the night. And so I want to get your initial thoughts on a former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley. Yeah, you know, Nikki Haley is a figure in the Republican Party that I, you know, once admired. I, I thought she really represented a, a hopeful future for, for the Republican Party. Uh, she's a, a woman. She has, she's Indian American. Her, her family, uh, you know, worked hard to kind of make it in this country. She grew up in South Carolina, you know, by her own admission, she did face discrimination because she was a, a brown woman in, in the South, you know, in, in a world that was largely white. And she overcame obstacles to become at a very young age, the governor of South Carolina. And, you know, early on, she was a, a leader on, on race, you know, wanting to remove the Confederate flag. Last night, though, I have to say, you know, it was a, I was, I was just incredibly disappointed as I've continued to be with, with Nikki Haley. You know, at some point when she was in uh, working for, she was the ambassador to U the UN, Trump's pick as ambassador to the UN, you know, it seemed like she, she may sort of exhibit some independence, but there was a real turn as there has been for so many uh, Trump administration officials where she decided she was just going to defend him, kind of as they say in the, in the South, whole hog. And, and she really traded and sold out her principles. And the examples of that last night, I mean, first of all, um, you know, I think it was purposeful. She didn't even name the, fa the, fa the, you know, name the fact that she advocated to remove um, the Confederate flag in, in South Carolina. Um, she uh, advocated for and defended Donald Trump's foreign policy, even saying, you know, that fawning over it, saying that it was the, the best foreign policy, that he's been incredibly strong on, on foreign policy. And, you know, the idea that she could say that when we recently learned that he knew about Russian bounties on our troops in Afghanistan, um, that, you know, according to Bolton, he cheered for the concentration camps in China. You know, we know that he fawns over dictators. She's a smart woman. She knows those things make America weaker, that they compromise our freedom. They compromise our security. So, and so she Mindy, stood up on that stage and she defended I, him. I want to ask you this question. You said something very interesting. You said she's a smart woman. Why do you think so many smart individuals continue to back the president? You know, it's it's careerism. They know that the Republican base is behind the president. And if they want a future in the Republican Party, they believe that they need to get behind Trump fully, that right now it is his party. But I'll say that's why this type of convention is so important, because it's important to build a competitive center right political movement, a movement that, you know, now is, is modest, but significant and growing. And the more that it grows and the more political power that such a movement has for those on the center right and independence and center, uh, the more that the Nikki Haley's of the world won't feel that they're backed into a corner to have to uh, defend and even advocate for, for ideas and really kind of silliness. I mean, this cultist kind of disinformation and gaslighting uh, that they don't they don't really believe. Uh, so, you know, I, I it was a really unfortunate moment, I have to say. I, I feel like in this Trump era that, um, you know, so the people that I kind of once admired that I that I had hope in just continue to 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 disappoint, though, I will give Heath, you know, Tim Scott uh, was really the exception to that rule because he just seemed to go his own way. And even, um, you know, he opposed the president on one idea. I mean, he went against the president on the very pure and simple truth that 
mail-in voting is acceptable and it is fine in this election. And he he made a point to to encourage that and to encourage voting, which is right. not what we've been hearing from the president. And I, I found that it's it itself quite hopeful. Well, Mindy, I don't think you are alone. I think millions of Americans join you in, in being disappointed in what we see so far. I wanna thank Mindy and Heath. Our delegates have been working behind the scenes to deliberate and ratify some of our principles. Take a look at a small sample of the work they've been doing. Hi, Boyd Rogers, uh, Fort Mill, South Carolina. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm from a small town just outside of Boston. Nathan or Nate, either one is fine. I am the uh, state leader for Stand Up Republic, North Carolina. Uh, Nina Rossetti from Monterey, California. I'm Jeff Patterson, Dallas, Texas. But my name is Ramona Zabriskie. I'm from Washington State. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Carlos J.C. Planis. I am from Miami, Florida. Hi, my name is Polly Calhoun. I live in uh, Minnesota. Hello, this is C.J. Deagle. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. I am Jill Valentine. I'm from Colorado. All people are created equal and free. Having the same inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Under the United States, we believe in an inclusive America defined by its ideals, welcoming all people, seeking safety, opportunity, and the prospect of contributing their talents to our diverse country. Well, I got to say that video is one of my favorite of the convention so far because it really showcases what this entire thing is about, our delegates and the ideas that we are putting together as Republicans and independents and conservatives coming together to really talk about what it means to be an American and what our country stands for. And those 13 principles, there's a lot that has gone into them. And that is why I am delighted, I'm honored, in fact, to introduce our next guests. Uh, these, these are three delegates that participated in this process, but who have also been in this fight for much longer uh, than just the last few months. And, and so I'm honored to have them with us and to share their ideas uh, with, with all of the attendees tonight. Uh, so on the line, line here, I've got Kathy Varga from Arizona. Dennis Sanders from Minnesota, and Matt Sarelson from Florida. I want to welcome them all to the convention. And I want to start with just a very simple question. You know, we meet at a time in our country where, you know, there's just chaos, there's distrust between uh, our fellow citizens and the two parties. I mean, the division runs deep. Why is this convention so important for uh, our country and for the ideas of you know, what the Republican Party stood for, but what are really core to the Constitution. And I wanna start, Kathy, with you. Why is this so important right now? Our founding fathers labored to create a country that we'd be free from fear and also from the tyranny of government. And so this is our chance to look at the big picture, examine our ideals, and look forward, know how we can move and take the next best steps. That's great, Kathy. And I, I really like what you say there about looking forward because November is going to come and he's either going to win or he's going to lose and Trumpism, uh, whatever happens, uh, the country's going to move on and we've got to be stronger in the future than we are today. So I really like that idea. Dennis, what are your thoughts on this? I know you're in Minnesota. You've been in this fight for a long time. Why is this so important right now? I think it's important and matters because it gives a view of what America can be. Um, I think last night, especially, it showed a very diverse America. Um, and an America, and especially 
a center right that actually cared yes. about issues such as racial justice. Um, I think hopefully what we're showing is a vision for the future of what the center right can be, one that is diverse, one that believes that America is made up of many voices. I think that's exactly right, Dennis. Matt, I want to go to you. Uh, you're in Florida. Um, you know, the issues in Florida are different. Um, what do you think about this convention and its importance to standing for these uh, core principles? Thanks for having me, Heath. This, this convention is so important. The Republican Party has gone so far, not just to the right, but in this weird direction that nobody really understands. Where most Republicans from 10 or 20 years ago, they're not electable in the Republican Party today. You can't see Reagan or Bush or even Nixon getting the nomination. At the same time, the Democratic Party is being pushed to this radical left that's really far removed from the Clinton uh, Democrats, the Biden Democrats. And so you're seeing this enormous polarization that isn't good. But there's a ton of people who are in the fierce center. We're in the middle, maybe a little to the left, maybe to the, a little to the right, like me. We don't really have a home right now. We are politically homeless. And this convention provides a third lane for those of us to, to guide a path to the future that the majority of Americans think will be prosperous and wonderful for all. Right. I think those are, those are all great points. Dennis, I want, I want to come back to you for a second. I, I know you chaired one of these drafting committees that we had uh, over the past week in anticipation of the convention to really hash out and refine um, these principles uh, in these Zoom calls with other delegates from around the country. Can you speak to a little bit about that process, how it went, and the ideas that were shared in that conversation? Sure. Um, my committee was um, based on principle eight, and that is basically dealing with um, immigration and refugees. And so I think the, the ideas that were coming in were ones that were very much stressed on, on welcoming people, um, keeping with the tradition of America, a place that welcomed uh, people from all corners of the world and, and a place where they were looking forward to using their talents and skills to enhance our nation. Um, and I think what was fascinating was how much people wanted to show that, again, this is a, a, a movement and a country that embraces diversity. Um, and so we had very different ways of how we wanted to get that out there. But in the end, that was the, the drive of, of all of the people was to, to make sure that they knew that their inclusion did matter. That's great. That's great to hear that these conversations were so inclusive and that that was really uh, something that was top of mind for all of the delegates that were participating in the conversation. Kathy, I want to come back to you really quickly. Now, you've been on the front lines of this fight out in Arizona. And, and I think, um, you know, I think I, I heard that you maybe supported the president in 2016 and have since, you know, quickly realized that that was a mistake. How did you reach that conclusion? I think a lot of Americans are going through a similar process right now of realizing uh, just how bad uh, this president has been with his ideas for the country, his rhetoric dividing us. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that process and the fight that is going on in Arizona? Absolutely. So the 2016 election was really difficult. And like many people, I looked at the two choices uh, the two main party choices and didn't feel comfortable with either one of them for a variety of reasons. But for me, I decided that I wanted to vote for something rather than against something. And so as a religious conservative, I did decide to vote for Donald Trump on behalf of the Supreme Court. But, you know, I hoped that he would rise to that office. I had hoped that his Republican colleagues and other advisors would have been more supportive in guiding him in better ways. But we know that immediately he was using hatred and divisive rhetoric to get to what he wanted to accomplish. And I was worried about it very quickly. I decided to get involved after I spent a summer working with Yazidi refugees over in Sarah's Greece. And it was there when I heard their stories and uh, was so touched by them that I decided I really needed to come back home. 
and make sure that we didn't follow that same divisive rhetoric that I, I saw getting worse with time. And that's why this election in November is so important. Wow, that's a powerful story, Kathy. Uh, thank you for sharing it. I, you know, I think a lot of Americans are, are in your shoes right now. And, and, it is, and it is hard as principled conservatives, many of us, uh, the delegates are principled conservatives, former Republicans, maybe still Republicans. It's hard to, to, to make that switch and put country over party. Uh, and, and the fact that so many are doing it is a testament to just how bad this president has been, how divisive he has been. Matt, I wanna go to you. Uh, you also ha have been on the ground there in Miami uh, really standing up and raising your voice in defense of the Constitution, of you know, limited government, all of the things that have traditionally characterized the Republican Party. You were there on the ground with us. I remember we, you know, when we were having those early grassroots meetups as a part of Principles First in you know, bars and restaurants, you showed up and, and helped organize folks and, and got them energized around these ideas. How do you see the president's message faring in Florida? Uh, is the ground changing? It's an important electoral state. And I just, I'm curious if Republicans are starting to um, change their tune with respect to the president. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a great question. And, and I don't know that I have a really good answer to that. Florida is divided 50-50. If you leave South Florida, Florida is definitely Trump country. Make no doubt about it. Uh, Miami and Broward, definitely Biden country. But, you know, 20 million uh, Floridians, probably half of them will vote. You know, it's just too hard to tell. Uh, there, there's still a lot of people out there who they really like Trump. They like his disruption. Um, they're not they're not conservative in what would have been conservative 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And there's a lot of states where you almost get to throw away your vote because it's so one sided. That's not the case in Florida. You need to vote in Florida. It may come down to 500 votes like it did in 2000. Yes. And of course, in Florida, the, the coronavirus hitting pretty hard there, uh, although getting under under control now. But I, I, I suspect that that will come into play as we head to November as well. I, you know, we're running out of time here, but I do want to close with what I think, you know, is, is really important. And that is, you know, we have a lot of people tuning in from around the country, all of our delegates. And a lot of times the voices that matter, and really all of the time, the voices that matter the most are the voices of voters and, and people who are really engaged. And so I want to ask each of you very quickly before we end this segment, you know, in, in a short sentence or two, what is the one thing that you would communicate to your fellow citizens, American voters around this country before they head into the ballot box to cast their vote this November? And Kathy, I'll start with you. We must let hope be our guide. There's a lot of cynicism that government can be better, but it can. So we need to let hope in our ideals, hope in our fellow Americans, and even hope that our government can be better to, to guide our next steps and we'll see amazing things happen. Thank you, Kathy. Dennis, Dennis, how about you? What are, what are, what's the one idea that you would communicate? That it's not a normal election. This is not Republican versus Democrat. And it's not even third party, which is what I did in 2016. It's about the future of our nation. Um, do we want to live up to our ideals or are we going to go in another darker direction? This year, this fall needs to be a decision um, for hope. Thank you, Dennis. Matt, last words. I've been a Republican my whole life. I'm still a member of the Republican Party. I've been a lawyer for Republicans for 10, 15 years. But this year is an exception. I can't vote for Trump. I didn't in 2016. I can't do it this year. What we need is a return to normalcy. Once we go back to normal, then we can go back to having the regular fights that liberals and conservatives have been having for 100 years. But this year, vote for normalcy. Vote for decency. That's my answer. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Kathy, Dennis, Matt. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us here this evening and talk through these uh, important issues for the country. And at this time, it, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speech of the night. Just, just an incredible speech uh, from someone who knows a thing or two about doing the tough things and leading in Washington, catching arrows from both sides, but staying true to what he believes and trying to do the right thing. Here's a speech 
from former FBI Director Jim Comey. America has always depended on the truth. When you have a dispute with some guy who repaired your roof and end up in small claims court, it matters that the guy tells the truth and that he's going to have a problem if he lies. It matters that the teenagers who hit you from behind at a stop sign tell the truth to the police officer who responds, and that if they lie, there will be consequences. It matters that judges and prosecutors don't treat you differently because of who you are, or what you look like, or who you know. Lady Justice wears a blindfold, so all Americans get fair treatment. It matters when the President of the United States trashes all that, lying constantly, attacking judges and prosecutors and investigators. It matters that the president insists upon special treatment for his friends and destruction of his enemies. It matters when the president obstructs justice and encourages other people to lie or to withhold evidence to protect him. The justice system in the United States is built upon the idea that the truth is a real thing and that it must be spoken by everybody and that we all play by the same rules. As the Justice Department's own manual says, the rule of law depends upon the even-handed administration of justice. Even-handed. That means you get a fair shake whether you're Republican or Democrat or neither. That means you get treated the same whether you've been to Mar-a-Lago or not. That means it doesn't matter whether Donald Trump likes you or not, because the investigators, prosecutors, and judges are going to treat you fairly even if you don't care for Vladimir Putin or you've never swapped messages with Don Jr. about Russia or WikiLeaks. And the chief prosecutor in this country, the Attorney General of the United States, is not the president's personal attorney. He and his institution have obligations to all of us equally. No matter how many times the president tweets, the Attorney General shouldn't be cutting breaks to the president's friends and pursuing his enemies. No matter how badly the president wants to use a Bible as a political prop, the Attorney General of the United States should not be ordering violence against Americans exercising their right to free speech. He has a duty to all of us under the law. I worry that a lot of Republicans don't like what they see in the attacks on even-handed law enforcement, but they tell themselves that they don't need to worry about it because their team is in control. I hope they don't think that. But if they do, they're being short-sighted because someday that corruption could come for them or someone they love. Because if Donald Trump becomes our tradition, nobody is safe. If the Justice Department starts deciding who to prosecute based on politics, all Americans are at risk because eventually your party will be out of power, which means you could be investigated. That's not America. Donald Trump has a way of staining everyone around him, and that sure has been true of Attorney General William Barr, who was a respected lawyer before he decided to join the Trump administration and ended up marching through Lafayette Square on Trump's Bible mission. He was a respected lawyer before he decided to serve with a president who called people cooperating with the Department of Justice rats and praised those who obstructed justice and lied to protect him. A president who took Putin's side over his own intelligence community, who routinely lied about the people of the FBI. A president who smeared Robert Mueller, a true American patriot who literally bled for this nation in Vietnam and then devoted his life to serving the country. In a way, it's sad what has happened to Bill Barr. I wish he had the character not to be warped by Donald Trump. Maybe a stronger, more principled attorney general would have been able to protect the rule of law. But then maybe he would have gotten fired for trying. It happens. Regardless, he decided not to risk his job by standing up, which is sad at the end of a long career. But it's much sadder what Trump and Barr have done together to the nation's trust in the Department of Justice and the rule of law. Trump hasn't accomplished a whole lot, but he created at least one legacy that's longer than his wall. He managed to convince millions of Americans that the federal justice system doesn't operate with integrity and that its employees routinely fail to tell the truth. And from the beginning, Attorney General Barr copied his president, 
repeating the dishonesty about the department's work and responding to Trump's demands for investigations and prosecutions of his enemies. The Department of Justice was damaged by that. It was damaged again when the Attorney General misled the American people about the work of the special counsel investigating the president. And again, when the Attorney General intervened in a case involving the president's friend Roger Stone to overrule the sentencing recommendation of career prosecutors. And again, when the Attorney General tried to drop a case in which Michael Flynn, a political ally of the president, had already pleaded guilty twice. If we're going to be a healthy nation, the damage must be repaired. Lady Justice's blindfold has to be restored. The facts and the law, not race or wealth or loyalty to Donald Trump, must be the only thing that matters. And no matter your politics, no matter your policy passions, you should see it the same way. Because this isn't about being a Democrat or a Republican, libertarian or independent. This is about what it means to be American. When it comes to our core values, there is no them. There's only us. The United States is a country that by most historical measures shouldn't even exist. Americans don't come from a common heritage or religion or language or culture. We have none of the normal glue to bind together a collection of humans from across the globe into a nation. Instead, we're an experiment. For two and a half centuries, we've been held together by a set of values. Yes, we've always fallen short. After all, we held truths to be self-evident while we held human beings as slaves. But our values are the glue. Together, we hold truths. One of our most sacred values is that the truth exists, that it must be sought, it must be spoken. That is our center, our touchstone. The founders created a system for us to have the best chance of finding the truth. It depends upon oaths and promises, solemn commitments to tell the truth, whether it's your roofer or the president of the United States. Donald Trump's presidency represents a continuing frontal assault on the truth, on the very idea that truth even exists. It began with the first lie about his inauguration crowd being bigger than Barack Obama's. But so many lies, thousands of them, have followed that we risk becoming numb to it. And in that numbness, there's danger that the flood of lies could wash over the touchstone of truth against which we've always measured our leaders and wash it away like a sandcastle at the beach, that we give up on the truth and then we're lost. We have lots of policy differences in this country, but those are for another day. The obligation now of all who care about America's values, about its institutions and the rule of law, is to vote in defense of those values and institutions. Because without those, we aren't America any longer, and our policy differences don't matter at all. We need a president who will reflect the core values of honesty and decency that are the lifeblood of this country and its institutions. We need a president who isn't a pathological liar, we need a president who will appoint an attorney general not because he needs a personal defense lawyer, but because American justice needs a guardian. We need leaders who have devoted their lives to the rule of law. We need to elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris this November. Thank you. Thank you to former FBI Director James Comey. The dangers of a politicized Justice Department are very real. And we have seen over nearly four years of the Trump administration of the rule of law. But as Comey said, the power is still within our hands to steer the country back towards a more equitable and just society. Up next, our next speaker, Penny Slade Sawyer. Hello, I'm Penny Slade Sawyer. I am a Republican and I have spent my entire professional career preventing disease and promoting health. America, the greatest country in the history of the world has stumbled. America has failed to contain the worst health crisis in over a hundred years. And in our failure, we have experienced immense suffering. 
lost jobs, lost homes, lost lives, not enough sleep, not enough money, not enough food, not enough hope. The reasons we've done so poorly are complicated. For the purposes of this message, I will list three. One, COVID is a new, highly contagious virus. That means we have a lot to learn about it. And COVID is not waiting for our scientists to get it all figured out. Two, based on what we already know, in order to contain COVID, our large, complex country must come together and pull together. Without good health, there is little economic will. The fastest way to restore a robust economy is to work together to restore our health. All for one and one for all. Three, we need high level leadership, laser focused on uniting us, comforting us, showing us in words and deeds that even though the actions necessary to contain the virus are not perfect, if we all carry them out, we can contain COVID and return to our lives. President Trump has not made America great as we address COVID-19 and its fallout. President Trump's leadership has been inadequate to unite us and lead us. During a worldwide pandemic like COVID-19, clear, understandable and actionable communication based on facts and delivered by trusted leaders can help motivate people to make choices that benefit themselves, their loved ones and their communities. Conversely, during a crisis, if leaders create narratives by ignoring, misrepresenting, or simply confusing facts, truth is compromised and trust is weakened. When leaders undermine experts and choose to ignore fact-based information, those they lead may become befuddled, not knowing who to believe or what actions to take. Many Americans admire and trust President Trump. They follow his lead, betting their lives and livelihoods on his interpretation of the science and his advice on how to cope with COVID. The costs of following President Trump continue to mount in lost health, wealth, and life. I am shocked and disheartened by President Trump's wishful thinking that the virus might disappear or that his administration has the virus under control. His apparent failure to grasp the developing science around this novel pathogen is frightening. His inability to lead America through the narrow pathways that preserve individual liberty when possible, yet serve to promote good health for all is a grave failure in my eyes. President Trump's decisions regarding COVID-19 are only one example of how inferior leadership harms us in the present. There are obvious others in areas like immigration, race relations, and statesmanship. He has sown seeds of divisiveness that separate us and lead us to see those different from ourselves in race or creed or national origin as threatening our way of life. And I fear that unless we act in positive and assertive ways, these destructive ideas may outlive his presidency and harm our future. I hope that soon the Republican Party can again become a party that appeals to large groups of Americans with wide ranging compassionate conservative opinions. I hope the party's new leaders will step back from the overheated media frenzy that whipsaws all of us 
from crisis to crisis and engage in meaningful conversations that repair long neglected funding for our public health heroes and reform long standing inequities in our communities. These threaten our traditions and families and businesses. I hope that our country can heal its wounds, that public trust can be restored in government, in the rule of law, in impartial justice, in the founding principles that made our country the best that's ever been. I hope you will vote. I hope you will vote to affirm and strengthen the principles that support and sustain the United States of America. This is an important moment in our country's story. Thank you for all you're doing to make it successful. Thank you so much to Penny Slay Sawyer. So during that speech, we had a little break in news, and that is a first for a political national convention. And the president just pardoned founder and CEO of Las Vegas-based Hope for Prisoners, Inc., John Ponder. We also just discovered tonight that a speaker was just bumped from the Republican National Committee convention, Marion Mendoza, who is a conspiracy theorist, one of the QAnon folks. Not surprised there, of course. Uh, thankfully, we've enlisted the help of our citizen statesmen and women to refine some of the core principles of, of our uh, event that we're having tonight. And so I want to bring in our panel, Brad and Reed, to help me talk about all of this and so much more. Guys, I want to get your immediate reaction before I go into any questions about what you just heard. Yeah, I am not surprised, one, uh, that we would have a conspiracy theorist speaking at the RNC this year. We have seen so much of that uh, from so many fringe groups on the right, and that's not what the party about is about. It's not about principles. They aren't about values, uh, and I'm not surprised that they would be in the mix, um, and, and, and I, I, I defer to, to, to Reed for more. I mean, you know, Reed, so what, what are your thoughts, man? I mean, a conspiracy theorist, I think it's an honorable thing that the gentleman was pardoned. From some information that we have that have come out so far, he seems to be someone who is a redeemable individual. But the conspiracy theory stuff, Reed, I mean, it seems to have taken control of the Republican Party. You know what, Sir Michael, I, I wanted to say two things on that. One, doing a political pardon in the middle of a convention is... Um, another troublesome sign of Trump using the awesome powers of the presidency for his own political props and purposes. And who knows, it may be worthy of a pardon himself. Um, and if in terms of the conspiracy theorists, which are abounding at the RNC right now, that's why I'm so grateful that our delegates, this convention and this movement have put forward principle number six, which is speaking truth and embracing facts. We need that for good government now more than ever before. And so Reed, I wanna stick with you and talk a little bit about COVID-19. We're six months into this pandemic, over 178,000 Americans have died. And recently the president is talking about a vaccine, fast tracking vaccine, perhaps even getting one before the November election. Do you think this is a serious thing? What are the repercussions or is this a political ploy uh, from the president? You know what? COVID is serious and it did not have to be this bad. It's another example of Trump's incompetent governance and it is hurting people. And that's why I really appreciated what Penny Slade Sawyer just said. She said the fatal consequences of ignoring truth. And that's what Americans are experiencing every day when a loved one or a neighbor gets sick. And that's why we need facts in our governing and Donald Trump is not delivering. And so I, I wanna also bring you and Brad to talk about something here. And, and I'm gonna just go to social media a little bit, guys. And I, I tweeted about this earlier in the day. And yeah. Brad, this is from one of the RNC speakers who happens to have a brown son. And she said, and I quote, statistically, my brown son is more likely to commit a violent offense over my white sons. So she says it would be smart for police officers to essentially racially profile her brown son. What's your response to that? Uh, you know, and I, I saw the exact same post on social media and my immediate response was to just call pure and utter BS. 
Um, I myself am a brown son, a black or brown son of, of black parents, and I am also a parent of a black son. And I cannot believe the sheer audacity uh, and the disrespect to look at my child and know with the values that I've raised them and with the community that, that they've been raised in uh, to say that statistically they're more likely to commit a crime and police would be more uh, would be more smart to racially profile them. That's just incorrect. We live in a country of innocent until proven guilty. We live in a country uh, that's founded on values where every where every group of people, regardless of what their ethnicity or racial uh, or religious background might be, has a respect for law, has a respect for rule and order. And we need to understand that every community brings that to the table because we are all Americans. And there is no reason in any way, shape, form, or fashion where law enforcement can engage with individuals in their communities uh, with that sort of bias as they come to the table. It's completely unacceptable. And as a party, we can't accept it. Reed, I got to get you in on this, man. I see you shaking your head, so I know you're ready to say something. Jump in there. You know, I, what I want to say is that the fish rots from the head. And we've seen Donald Trump use very similar rhetoric. I wouldn't be surprised if this had come out of Trump himself. These are the types of people he is promoting in party leadership. And this is what the Trump Republican Party stands for, unfortunately. That's why we have to say no more. I couldn't agree more. I want to thank Brad and Reed, and we'll be seeing more of them throughout the, tonight. Partisanship has long been a problem in America and often stands in the way of compromise and common sense solutions. Former Congressman David Jolly thinks it's time to take off the red and the blue jerseys. Welcome to the convention on founding principles. I'm former Congressman David Jolly former Republican Congressman David Jolly, now proudly an independent with no formal party affiliation. Our founders chose a republic because as Madison wrote, a republic can best discern the true interest of the country and give voice more consonant with the greater good. But what if that's no longer the case? What if we have so undermined our republic that our voices of leadership do not give voice more consonant with the greater good? That's why I find myself today an advocate for electoral reform, democracy reform, voting reform, to return power to the voters, and to create a reward system for politicians that recognizes those who give voice to the most number of people, not simply to their party. As an independent with no party affiliation, because my journey is one which is not uncommon among some who may be in attendance today. It's not uncommon among some former Republicans or even current Republicans today. But my journey, I think, has led me to a destination that might be just a little bit different. As I saw the candidacy of our now president, Donald Trump, emerge and a party embrace and celebrate Trumpism, it solidified for me that my hopes of pushing the GOP towards a more inclusive platform towards empowering all people, towards approaching tough issues like marriage equality, environmental science, campaign finance reform, guns, that approaching these issues with a human touch, with an embrace for perhaps non-traditional GOP voters, well, that hope was not to be found in today's Republican Party. And so like many, I left the party. But what I did not to expect to experience was the relief that came with abandoning partisanship. There was natural relief of, of unyoking my frustration that had tethered me to the Republican Party for many years. But the relief that came from rejecting partisanship was something I did not expect, to lay down my red jersey but not pick up another one. Because it allowed me to study the issues with a new perspective. And it affirmed for me that the solutions to some of today's most vexing public policy problems are truly just within reach. But what stands in the way is an entrenched duopoly of the two major parties, whereby they share a common interest in maintaining their duopoly and in distancing themselves from accountability. They share an interest in making re-election easy, making their re-election safe, and making reflection unnecessary. In this journey, I've also found inspiration that change is indeed possible, 
we find ourselves in this moment in a chapter where voters are frustrated. They are angry because nothing seems to really change in our politics. And if we ask ourselves, do we expect our fundamental, fundamental politics to change regardless of who wins this election? Sure, our leadership will. The tone of our leadership might. But will our politics really change? I think the answer is no, and it is because today's system is rigged. Consider the issues of electoral reform. Consider gerrymandering, closed primaries, today's campaign finance system, continuous attempts at voter suppression. Each one of these are a tool of the two major parties that choke off independent thought. Each one of these may find some common defense in the Constitution. But you know what else finds defense in the Constitution? The words of Madison, the words of Jefferson, the warnings of Washington. Electoral reform, voting reform, democracy reform are all, are all validated in the intrinsic powers left to the people in the very writings of our Constitution. Look, the consequences of this doom loop of electoral rigging is obvious. We see it in the service of our politicians every day. To put it another way, our politicians are simply responding to a reward system to ensure they will get reelected, to ensure that they can keep their job. But what if we changed that reward system? Imagine a competing system, one that encouraged a true contest of ideas, that rewarded politicians for the strength of their arguments, not for the strength of their partisanship. I'll offer you three examples. Consider the politics around President Obama's Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. We remember it well. There essentially were three constituencies in the national health care policy debate. The first were those that needed additional access, greater access to health care. Perhaps they did not have an employer-based plan. Then there were, were, was a constituency that needed more affordability. And finally, a third constituency that truly saw disruption as a result of the ACA. Their prices went up, they lost their plan, they lost their doctor. But today's system rewarded Democrats for speaking only to the first two constituencies, those who needed greater access and more affordability. And today's system rewarded Republicans for speaking only to the third. Show me a party that will speak to all three constituencies and I will show you a governing party for the next 20 years. On the issue of immigration today, one party speaks to border security. The other speaks to the human toll that comes with the uncertainty of one not knowing their ultimate status here in the United States. Democrats are rewarded for speaking to the latter, Republicans for speaking only to the former. Show me a party that speaks to both constituencies and I'll show you a governing party for decades to come. On guns, let's recognize that the Second Amendment provides a fundamental right, but it is not an absolute right. It is not beyond the reach of reasonable regulation. Republicans speak only to protecting the Second Amendment as an absolute right, a false argument in my personal opinion. Democrats often only speak to the amount of regulation they would like to apply to that right. Show me a party that will defend the Second Amendment but also recognize that for instance, when it comes to weapons of war, it might be reasonable to expect that it be as difficult to acquire an assault weapon as it is to get a security clearance. We can protect the Second Amendment while also protecting the rights of law-abiding gun owners. Show me a party willing to have that conversation, and I will show you a party that will be a governing majority for decades to come. A party or a coalition, a consensus that can build around common sense on issues like healthcare, immigra immigration, guns, taxes, foreign policy, requires a level playing field requires unrigging today's electoral system. And the good news is voters have taken that task in their own hands. In states like Florida, Arizona, in Maine, in California, we are seeing gerrymandering be moved to independent uh, commissions. We are seeing primaries be opened up where all candidates are having to compete in the same primary or all voters are having an opportunity to vote. In Maine, we are seeing experiments with ranked choice voting. These reforms can happen. And when it comes to money, just look at the success of candidates who are now rejecting big dollar dark money 
or at least PAC money, who are discouraging dark money, and who are relying on a coalition of small dollar donors. That can be done. Think about the renewed focus, unfortunately, on voter suppression laws and what it takes to undo some of the voter suppression tactics we are seeing in states across the country. This is the moment where voters can grab electoral reform, democracy reform, voting rights reform, and actually change our entire political system. But I will tell you that today's system rewards only the fight. It doesn't reward the solutions. It doesn't reward cross-partisanship. Let's create a platform that does that. And that is the key point of electoral reform and democracy reform and voting reform, to reward those who best represent the most number of people who are authentic in their leadership, who appeal across party lines. Electoral reform, democracy reform, very importantly, is not a call for moderation in your ideology. Being a moderate is an ideology, just as being a conservative or a progressive is. That is a, a conviction held by people. But while this is not a call for moderation, it is a call for a system that rewards cross-partisanship. And that is what America wants today. Madison said a republic will give voice more consonant to the greater good. Let's restore that republic that Madison wrote about. Let's restore that founding principle because we can do this together. Thank you. Thank you to former Congressman David Jolly. There are so many problems facing not just our country, but the world that we have to start working together rather than vilifying each other. That's the essence of one of our favorite sayings here, country over party. That saying just isn't about our elected officials, it's about us as citizens, voters, and neighbors. We have to make ourselves heard, but we also have to listen, which is a good reminder to bring in Evan and Mindy. So Evan, I wanna to go to you first and just get your initial reactions to former Congressman David Jolly. Well, I thought it was a tremendous speech for Michael. You know, many of our speeches tonight and, and through the convention addressed very near-term, immediate problems, challenges that the country is facing. You know, whether it's threats against the rule of law, we heard Comey speaking on that, of course, or, or the need for us to, to have better leadership to get over, to get past this pandemic, uh, as we just heard uh, from, uh, from our, our other speaker. And it's just you know, this, this speech in particular from David Jolly stands out because he's talking about long-term problems uh, or long-term solutions uh, to, to the challenges that this country faces. And, you know, one problem is extreme partisanship. And, and he's somebody, David Jolly is somebody who advocates for electoral reform so that we get more uh, unifying, effective leaders. He goes on during this speech to talk about uh, ways that, that we can find solutions to even the most difficult problems we face. Um, but we need to have leaders who are incentivized by a system to find that common ground, to, to build on it, and to deliver solutions through it. You know, he says that we need a, a system that rewards leaders for the strength of their ideas, not the strength of their partisanship. He says that today's system rewards only the fight it doesn't actually reward solutions. And so he advocates for reforms to uh, gerrymandering. So uh, reforms like independent redistricting commissions or ranked choice voting, which allows voters to rank order their vote and inspires and incentivizes candidates to find common ground with, ground with their opponents and, and to offer actual solutions that uh, are possible and unifying and effective. Uh, as well as open primaries, that's another one. So all of these, these reforms uh, you know, are incentivized or, or are, are, are designed to incentivize better competition in our system. Right now, our system is, is such that you win by showing how partisan you are if you're running for office. Uh, but obviously that's going to change if, if our country is going to get over modern challenges that it faces. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Mindy, that leads me to our next question here about changing the process, changing the system so that we can elect the right individuals. Uh, current Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo is in Jerusalem where he is expected to make a convention speech. Now, according to the White House, he's doing it in his 
personal capacity. However, there appears to be some blurred lines that I think most would agree is in violation of the Hatch Act. Yeah, you know, our democracy is really struggling and, and needs so many fixes right now. I mean, there's the electoral fixes to change the incentives so we get leaders that focus on problem solving. And then we have this problem, you know, there's so much corruption kind of up and down the government right now. And, and we have within the Trump administration just really an unprecedented abuse of governing institutions um, to, for politics and politis, you know, his officials in the Trump administration politicizing their, their roles. And so tonight what we're seeing at the convention that's you know, going on concurrently with, with our, our convention here tonight is, is a further shattering of norms. Um, and one of those norms is, you know, I, I think that maybe the first time it certainly is, is not normal for the Secretary of State to speak at the party convention. Um, and that's what we have happening. And not only is he speaking, but he's he's speaking from Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, in his kind of government, he's the Secretary of State. You know, his job is diplomacy with uh, foreign, you know, governments and, you know, our, our, our allies and, and kind of creating peace in the world. And yet he's kind of abusing that position and politicizing it tonight. It is a violation, actually, of the Hatch Act. We see other things like President Trump, um, I think, issued a pardon from the RNC tonight. That is also a shattering of norms throughout this convention. We're going to see speeches that are taking place for a party convention from the White House. I mean, this is truly un unprecedented. Uh, it is, you know, in the Pompeo case, it's, it kind of reeks of a, a pandering to an evangelical base. Um, and, you know, we also have the fact of the matter that at the State Department, Secretary Pompeo is charged with enforcing this policy for other State Department employees that they don't use their, uh, you know, their position or their office for political purposes. And, and he himself is going and doing that tonight. So that is that is quite troubling. And, and like I say, mm -hmm. when we talk about building a better future, it is certainly some of these electoral fixes that Mr. Jolly spoke about that I think we'll hear soon uh, from Nilmeni Rubin and others tonight that, El that Evan spoke about but it is also just rooting out this politicizing um, kind of across the board and, and up and down, uh, you know, within the, within the present, within the administration, which is what we see in the, in the Trump era. And, and Evan, really quickly, I want to just go to you based on all of your experiences as a CIA officer, what do you think the dangers are of blurring these lines? Well, I think the, the danger is is a question of corruption, really. And, you know, we've got another tremendous speech coming up from Gary Kasparov uh, on the issue of corruption. And, you know, I, I don't want to steal his thunder too much, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that speech very much. Uh, but look, when, when our government officials use the official powers, the powers of their office to benefit themselves, whether financially, we see a lot of that in the Trump administration, or politically because they want to hold on to power, um, then we, we start to create a, you know, a, a system where um, Americans, uh, Americans' rights are suffering, where um, it's about who you know, not what you know. Um, the whole country changes when, when you have a leader like that who decides to serve him or herself before the interests of the American people. And we're going to hear more about that from Gary Kasparov. But I think what this is, is, you know, as Mindy was describing all of that, yes, a violation of the Hatch Act and breaking of norms and all of that. There's another word for all of these things. It's corruption. And we'll, again, we'll talk more about that later on tonight. I want to thank both uh, Mindy and also Evan, and we'll see them, of course, throughout tonight. One of the most important political issues America is facing today is voting. We know it's our duty as citizens, but how can we break down the barriers to voting and make our voting more effective? Now, many Rubin has some ideas. I'm Nilmini Rubin. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Fix the System. We are a coalition of organizations that are committed to fixing our democracy. I spent most of my career in Republican foreign policy. And I made the shift last year to U.S. political reform because I noticed the similarity between what was happening here in the United States and what we've seen in fragile and conflict-ridden countries. Imagine a world where you are able to register to vote smoothly. The adult citizens in your community, regardless of their race or their wealth, 
are also able to register without a hassle. Before the election, you get information about the candidates that helps you figure out who would push for the issues you care about most. And you think to yourself, wow, we have a lot of great choices. You might decide to submit an absentee ballot and you think about whether to drop it off in a lockbox or pop it in the mail. Or you might decide to vote early or just because it feels right and you have a really good looking mask, you might decide to go to the polls and cast your ballot in person. And then when the results come in without any snafus or irregularities, you have confidence that the voting rights of the people in your community were respected and the election was fair. This is the country we want to live in, the country we should live in, and the country we need to fight for. We cannot take our democracy for granted. The most brilliant thing that our founding fathers did was outline bold founding principles for our country and then set a clear way to change things because they understood one of the most important truths of our world, that things change. And it's up to us to make things change for the better. In 1776, some of the most beautiful words included in the Declaration of Independence were that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, that concept didn't make its way into the Constitution. Millions of Black people were enslaved legally to be bought and sold and deprived of basic human rights. Those Black people, Native American people, women, people of different faiths and ethnicities were not allowed to vote. And in fact, votes were initially only granted to white men that owned property. So we've been a work in progress for more than 240 years. Our democracy really just needed fixing from the moment it was created. So it is now up to us to uphold the truth of the founding principles, even though our founding fathers did not. I encourage you to help register people to vote, even people that don't agree with you. Cast your ballot, volunteer at your polling station, and push your members of Congress and your state representatives to fund this election. Voting during a pandemic requires spending that voting in normal times does not. Your vote counts, your vote matters. But right now, some votes actually matter more than others. Eligibility to vote varies in different states. So if you're a felon in Maine or Vermont, you can vote. But if you're a felon in 11 states like Delaware or Virginia, you lose your right to vote and you have to take steps to restore it. If you're an independent, you can't vote in a closed primary that so many states hold. In those cases, independents just have no say in picking the Democrat or Republican candidate. And for those who live in gerrymandered states, the only election that matters is the primary. So independents and people of the opposite party are just not able to weigh in. Fair representation depends on fair redistricting. Redistricting is redrawing the lines of congressional districts. So as a voter in a specific district, I would only vote for the representative in my district. My husband a few years ago actually ran for Congress. And we hauled our three children all across the district as he campaigned. And it was really far. Though we live close to D.C. in a uh, Maryland suburb, we were schlepping our kids up to areas close to Pennsylvania and West Virginia. My kids were like, why are we here? This doesn't make any sense that this would be daddy's district. And um, I explained to them, well, it's gerrymandering. So what is gerrymandering? So gerrymandering is the manipulation of those electoral boundaries where you draw the congressional district that dilutes minority votes and it consolidates political power into the dominant group. Different ways that people gerrymander are either packing, it's called packing or cracking. So packing is when you put a 
one group into one spot. And cracking is you disperse that group so widely that their votes barely matter. And that, that gerrymandering, it's leading to less competitive elections, less engaged voters, and unresponsive politicians. So actually only 5% of the congressional districts in the United States are considered highly competitive in the 2020 election cycle. That means 95% of our congressional representatives are pretty much decided in the primaries. One dangerous result of this is hyperpartisanship and polarization. Both sides are driven to the extreme when their primary, especially a closed primary, is the only election that matters. We need a Congress that can problem solve and pass legislation effectively, a citizenry that is not alienated by polarization. So redistricting matters right now. The census is underway. Every 10 years, we count how many people are in our country and we use that data to redraw congressional district lines. Following the 2020 census, congressional district lines will be redrawn in every single state, well, except for the seven who have low populations since they only have one district. And we need to ensure that the 2020 to 2021 redistricting process is a fair one. So what can you do about it? You can push your state legislature to come up with fair maps, ones that keep municipalities together and fairly make up, reflect the makeup of, our, of your district. When you push at the state level, it's going to make all of the difference at the federal level. Our democracy is fixable. We can champion change across the United States. Vote like your democracy depends on it. Push for fair redistricting. Together, let's fix the system. Our right to vote may be written into the Constitution, but it doesn't mean that we should take it for granted. As no many points out, there are real obstacles to voting for many Americans and even more ways to dilute and diminish the power of our votes. Defending these rights falls on all of us, and we have to defend them not just for ourselves, but for those who share our beliefs, but for every single American, regardless of their beliefs. Preserving the constitutional rights of all Americans also depends on a strong judiciary that is independent from political parties that appoint them. Our next speaker, former North Carolina Supreme Court Justice Bob Orr, reminds us of the dangers of a politicized court. I'm Bob Orr, a retired North Carolina Supreme Court Justice. Let me begin by thanking you for your time and interest in joining us for the first convention on founding principles. I'd like to talk briefly with you about one of those critically important principles, the need for an independent judiciary. We all tend to agree that judges need to be independent. Unfortunately, while both sides of America's vast political divide are happy to pay lip service to this concept, yet in their self-interest, Partisans really want the judiciary stacked with judges and justices that tend to favor their political or ideological perspective. Nowhere is this more evident than in the process of appointing and confirming federal judges. One of the most egregious examples of the high states politics played with federal judicial appointments came in 2016 after the untimely death of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. President Obama, on March 16, pursuant to the Constitution, nominated Chief Judge Merrick Garland, an experienced, well-respected member of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Like all other presidential nominations to the federal courts, the Constitution requires the advice and consent of the Senate. Historically and by long-standing practice, the term advise and consent means a confirmation process. This process has meant investigations into the qualifications of the nominee, testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and ultimately a vote by the full Senate on the confirmation or rejection of the nominee. Instead of following this historical process, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell 
steadfastly refused to allow the nomination of Judge Garland to come forward for a confirmation hearing and subsequent vote by the Senate. This action by McConnell was a flagrant abuse of power. There was no reason basis for denying Judge Garland a hearing and a vote, except McConnell and his Republican colleagues did not want an Obama nominee to get the vacant seat on the Supreme Court. Instead, McConnell's actions evidenced the very basis political motive, one grounded in a partisan mindset to block the nomination by a Democratic president, hoping that a Republican would become president after the 2016 election. McConnell and his allies were banking on a new president who would send forward partisan loyalists to fill any and all vacancies on the U.S. Supreme Court and other federal courts, not with women and men pledged to the independence of the judiciary and abiding by the Constitution and laws of our country, but instead judges and justices who could be counted on to rubber stamp the acts of the president and the Republican majority. Mitch McConnell got his wish. With the election of Donald Trump in 2016, the push for the appointment of lockstep conservative judges and justices across the entire federal judiciary took shape regardless of qualifications and experience. Trump's view of these appointments was not to fill vacancies to the federal bench with independent-minded jurists but instead to name individuals who would merely be an extension of his presidency and his objectives. Trump expected his appointments to the judiciary to be loyal servants, compliant with his dictates and actions in their rulings and decisions from the bench. The entire foundational concept of an independent federal judiciary was neither understood nor desired by the new president and Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans were more than happy to roll over and comply with Trump's demands. The specific beneficiary of Mitch McConnell's inaction was Judge Neil Gorsuch, nominated by Donald Trump for the still vacant seat on the Supreme Court. Judge Gorsuch got his hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the confirmation vote by the Senate putting him on the Supreme Court. Conservative partisans cheered the result. But in addressing the Senate Judiciary Committee, Judge Gorsuch articulated foundational principles and the need for an independent judiciary that he believed defined service on the court. Referencing the judicial figures who had been mentors to him, Judge Gorsuch stated, by their example, these judges taught me about the rule of law and the importance of an independent judiciary, how hard our forebears work to win these things, how easy they are to lose, how each generation must either take its turn carrying the baton or watch it fall. He went on to add, My decisions have never reflected a judgment about the people before me, only a judgment about the law, and the facts at issue in each particular case. A good judge can promise no more than that, and a good judge should guarantee no less. For a judge who likes every outcome he reaches is probably a pretty bad judge, stretching for policy results he prefers rather than those the law compels. Unfortunately, the cynics on the left didn't believe nor want to believe that Judge Gorsuch was sincerely and honestly reflecting his philosophy of being a judge. The cynics on the right arguably winked and nodded, feeling confident that Judge Gorsuch didn't really mean what he said and would be a reliable vote for their agenda. During this past term of the Supreme Court, national attention is focused on a series of cases in which Judge Gorsuch, Chief Justice Roberts, and Justice Kavanaugh, the other Trump nominee to the Supreme Court, have voted against the position advocated for by conservatives and President Trump. In the case of Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia, which addressed the applicability of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, the majority opinion was written by none other than Justice Gorsuch. 
Immediately, the partisans on the right began criticizing him. A writer for the American Conservative lamented about Judge Gorsuch's opinion, the demoralization of social conservatives is profound. Even more recently, Vice President Pence was quoted as saying how disappointed conservatives are in Chief Justice Roberts. Disappointed because he hasn't towed the ideological line advocated by the party faithful in every case. This damaging perspective of judges and justices being nothing more than political pawns in the war between partisan and ideological opponents must end. Such a view undermines the necessary independence of the judiciary, taints nominees to the bench with a partisan brush, and undermines the public's confidence in the impartial decision-making of our courts. Meeting ideological litmus test in order to be nominated and confirmed and then viewing decisions made by these jurists within the partisan framework serve ultimately to only undermine the very legitimacy of our courts. I fervently hope that the next President of the United States will heed those warnings. And make no mistake about it, I hope that the next President will be Joe Biden, not Donald Trump. Having been a registered Republican for 45 years, and having been elected four times to statewide judicial office as a Republican, I take my decision to support and vote for Joe Biden seriously. But I have confidence in Joe Biden's commitment to the constitutional principles that we stand for and the rule of law. I have no confidence that Donald Trump can move beyond his disregard and disdain for the rule of law and the constitutional underpinnings of our democracy, including the independence of our judiciary. As we stand here on the brink of a national election, we are faced with a sitting president intent on grabbing and consolidating any and every power of government that he can get away with. Unfortunately, Congress has failed to adequately rein in this despotic assertion of executive power and privilege. As envisioned by our founders, an independent judiciary devoid of partisanship and devoted to the constitutional rule of law stands as the last great constitutional restraint against such despotism. The responsibility falls on us to protect and defend that principle from those who would tear down our democratic foundations. We must not fail. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Orr, for those thoughtful words and for chairing this convention. I'd like to bring back in Heath Mayo. So Heath, Judge Orr spoke a lot about an independent judiciary. And I, I made some notes here about something that just happened several weeks ago during an interview with Vice President Mike Pence with Christian Broadcast Network. And he said Chief Justice John Roberts was a disappointment to conservatives. Heath, what do you say to that, man? Because certainly that is blurring the lines of an independent judiciary. Well, absolutely sure, Michael. I mean, we should not be looking at our judges as members of political parties or soldiers of certain political parties or causes. I mean, this is a long standing, uh, long festering problem with our constitutional system. I mean, when, we, when the country was founded, Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78 predicted famously that the judiciary would be the least dangerous branch, that what we had there were sort of legal scholars well studied in the law that would apply impartially the words that Congress passed. They would look at the words, interpret what the law meant, and then Congress could change based on uh, the, the judiciary's interpretation. But then over time, it's been, you know, two contributing factors have really politicized the courts in a, in a bad way. One hand, the courts. The courts judges during the 1960s, the Earl Warren Court started to interpret aggressively through judicial activism, uh, provisions of the Constitution in a way that made the court's decisions that much more weighty on the one hand. And then the executive, Congress completely abdicating its uh, you know, Article I authority to the president, presidents having to do more and more uh, to, to get their agenda done, really transgressing the separation of powers and, and throwing everything to the courts. And so what you see is a ratcheting up 
of the importance of judicial decisions in a very, very unhealthy way. And so now it seems every time a judge dies or retires, it, it, the, the nation's attention focuses like a laser on these judiciary committee hearings to see, you know, is this person going to interpret this constitutional provision this way or that way? And that is just not the uh, view of the judiciary that the founders had in mind. The founders envisioned the judiciary as independent, as you know, coldly interpreting the law, and then Congress passes the law. Um, Congress passes the law and the executive executes the law. And now what we have, we have, we have an executive writing laws without Congress, and we have courts you know, issuing five to four decisions that are very, very politicized, very fraught, and that are likely to change within the next couple of election cycles as uh, new parties nominate new judges that are likely just to serve their political causes. Sure, Michael, I think we need to get away from that. And so Heath, really, really quickly, the quickest answers you, you can give, do you think this is something that is longstanding or is this something that you think will pass? Well, certainly, as you look to the last couple of years, this is a, you know, a trend that has been festering. So I, I'm hopeful that if we get leaders in there who care about the Constitution and care about independent judges that are going to coldly apply the law as the founders intended, uh, I'm hopeful. But it's going to take leadership um, from, from those we elect. Well, Heath, look, I'll tell you this. I nominate you to the Supreme Court, my friend. Thank you so much. If you were watching the Democratic Party convention last week, you probably saw our next speaker, former Governor Christine Todd Whitman. She's one of many lifelong Republicans who cannot support Donald Trump. Tonight, she explains why he's such a threat to our democracy. First, let me say that I'm very sorry that we're not all there together in person. Um, the discussion that's gonna be going on and has been going on is an increasingly important one. I happen to be someone who believes very deeply that this country does best with a two-party system, a vibrant two-party system, and that can't happen if one party is to the extreme of another, way to the extreme. So we need to get back to what the Republican Party was. When I was growing up, it was defined by Dwight David Eisenhower. It was a party that respected the individual. It believed in keeping taxes low and balanced budgets, believe it or not. It believed in a strong international foreign policy and a strong military at home. And that was it. We didn't have a lot of litmus tests for every social issue that you can imagine. There were different ways of interpreting how we protected ourselves from foreign interference or for security at home. We also had that one of our platforms was to protect our shared environment and different ways of interpreting that. But we all agreed on the basic principles. That's what made the party what it was. I think we've gone way astray from that. And of course, the country right now is facing a pivotal moment. We are being hammered by an economy that saw its worst quarter growth since we've been keeping tra tabs on that. We have seen a pandemic that is has already destroyed the lives of 150,000 Americans, more than 150,000 Americans. And we have people rioting in the street because they don't trust the police anymore because they've watched some brutality that they can't abide with. Demonstrations that often start off peacefully and then unfortunately because of one or two or maybe a small group devolve into riots. And we need to get people back to where they trust the federal government, where they trust the rule of law, where they respect the rule of law. And that's one of the things we've lost. So there are a number of things that we can do. First and foremost, I believe that there has to be a clear message from a Republican party that says, Anyone who wants to vote, who is eligible to vote, has to have that right. We have to make it as easy as possible for people to vote, because when they feel they're disenfranchised, then they don't pay any attention to the rest of it. They don't believe in their government. They won't support their elected officials. And we have chaos. When people don't feel they're being heard, they have very few ways of expressing that that are peaceful, shall we say. The other thing we need to do is try to get back to what we've always considered as normal values. This isn't anything new. It's not Republican or Democrat. This is something that we've seen before. I mean, we always used to think that a president was two terms after George Washington until FDR. And after his fourth term, what do we do? We passed an amendment to say that presidential terms can see presidents can serve two terms and that's it. 
We used to think nepotism was not an issue until John F. Kennedy appointed his brother Robert as attorney general. And we passed a law saying you can't do that kind of thing. I believe that law needs to be uh, improved on a little bit these days. But we had reactions to these things. We did come up with policy. We can do that again. We need to, for instance, ensure that people have confidence in the rule of law and that there isn't political interference in everything. It used to be common that a very few number of people in the White House were allowed to, to engage with the Justice Department on ongoing cases. And when that happened, there was a list. There was a list of who it was, why they were reaching out to the Justice Department and what their interest was, what case it was. We need to get back to that. That needs to be enshrined in what the White House does. We need to ensure that science is not played with, that science is based in the opinions on science. So scientists have to be protected. They have to be protected if they come up with issues and see solutions that are uncomfortable or that people may not want. Sure, you put policy in on top of that. That's fine, but you don't take it out on the scientists. They have to be able to do their work based on what they find in science. And we need to respect that. We need to ensure that in the House and in the Senate, that the leaders don't have the kind of power that they have today, that they cannot just decide that they won't let a bill come forward, no matter how many members support it from both sides of the aisle. That's enormously frustrating to people. They don't know, they can't get things done. These are all suggestions. Many of them are suggestions that are in a report that was done, I co-chaired with Pete Bra for the Brennan Center at NYU. It's called the uh, Rule of Law and Democracy, Task Force on the Rule of Law and Democracy. And I urge you to take a look at that because I think you will find in it a number of suggestions, both for actions by the president and actions by the Congress that can help restore people's trust in government and in the rule of law. And that's the most important thing we can do starting now. There's also another report that came out on specifics that the president can do. Again, we get back to what we considered norms. And until this past presidential election, the norm was for presidential candidates to release their tax returns. Obviously, that didn't happen the last time around uh, with President Trump. But we need to require that. And that's one of the suggestions we have, that every presidential and vice presidential candidate should release tax returns for at least the previous three years, if not five years. That's another way to restore public trust. We need more transparency in government. And again, there are several suggestions on how we achieve that, both through the White House and through the Congress. I urge you to go to that report because I think you will find it interesting. And we have to remember that the most important thing we can do is to ensure that we have a vibrant second party, one that speaks to more than just a very small, small handful of people a group of people that live on the extremes. We can't keep going the way we're going. I am very worried for ourselves as an international country. I mean, we're losing our allies. Our allies don't trust us. They worry about it. We need to be clear about when you can engage with foreign power, certainly not in an election. That is against the law already. But we need to have more transparency around any other time that the president is engaging with a foreign power, not because of a treaty, but because of what they want to do uh, policy-wise. So there's a, there's a lot going on in this country. We have a lot to face, but we have, and we have a huge responsibility. And I would start with that responsibility of saying that everyone who is eligible to vote, vote. It's a disgrace to me that the Republican Party is now being called the party that's trying to suppress the vote. We're not back in the Jim Crow days. We cannot allow that to happen. We cannot be defined by that. We also have to get back to our caring about people, caring about those immigrants who have built this country. None of us were Native Americans. The Native Americans, the Native American Indian tribes were the natives here. We're not. And we need to remember that and give deference to the fact that the it's all that vibrancy that we get from the different cultures and the different people that have come to this country that have given us so much. If we start to get back to those things, if we start to reinforce those principles of the federal government, of the Republican Party and what it is, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. 
And I am sure that in the course of this convention, with the important issues that face us, that we'll be ready, come the fall, whatever happens, to try to ensure that we have a Republican Party that appeals to a broad base of support, not just a small minority. And I look forward to hearing and seeing all the recommendations that come from this conference and this convention. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for being part of it. And again, uh, good luck with all that you do. Thank you, Governor. It is alarming just how much damage has been done to our political norms. As a nation, we've come to expect leaders who abide by simple standards. Again, simple standards, not that difficult, President Trump and who respect lines that even if not legally binding are ethical, and we have to make sure we hold individuals like Mr. Trump accountable. I wanna bring in Mindy Finn, and, and Mindy, I wanna talk a little bit about what's going on with Donald Trump and the Republican Party. You have a Republican-controlled Senate, and they seem to allow this guy to, to literally get away with murder. I really do believe if he were to shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, they would pretend like, oh, it was justified or we don't know what happened. Yeah, you know, uh, people often kind of point to President Trump and say he has really shattered norms and, and he's the reason that we're so polarized and there's so much corruption and politics is really broken. Uh, but I think kind of more of those fingers need to point to Republicans in the Senate. I mean, this is why we have three branches of government. We have, you know, the Senate is supposed to be the, the greatest deliberative body. Um, we're supposed to count on them to be the, the sober minded individuals who can kind of center the nation and they are charged with holding the executive accountable and they have just refused to do their job. Um, you know, time and time again, I mean, it's kind of become a, a joke about people like Susan Collins or, you know, others who they'll, they'll express concern, but kind of at the end of the day, they always vote with him. Um, they excuse him. You know, obviously during the impeachment trials, they, they shut down even the, the ability to, to hear evidence. Um, which kind of said it all, which is that they, they knew he was guilty, uh, but they are afraid or they refuse to hold him accountable because they're afraid of their own kind of political futures and political fortunes. And this is, this is really one of the great problems that we have in the system today. And, and so Mindy, what do you think is the best way to hold Mr. Trump accountable? Granted, we have an election 60 days away. None of us really know what direction this is going to go. We also know that Mr. Trump does not play fairly. Yeah, so, you know, the, the election is coming 70 days away. I mean, I, I often say, and, you know, maybe it's, it sounds hyperbolic, but it happens to be the truth that our elections and our ability as uh, Americans to vote is really the last bastion. It is the last defense of democracy. We have a nation of self-rule. We have a nation where our leaders are supposed to be accountable to us. And if we don't have a Congress that's going to hold them accountable, we don't, you know, obviously their party's not holding them accountable. They are in control of, of putting in a lot of the judges and justices who are then not going to hold them accountable uh, or, really st or really hold uh, to the law. Then the only recourse that we have is the vote. It's, the, our, it's our elections. In 2018, obviously Democrats took over the House and there was this huge turnout against President Trump. And so he's been held accountable to some extent. And now we have in, in 2020 really kind of the best and maybe the only opportunity to hold him accountable. Because remember, this is the man who jokes about being president for, you know, many terms or president for life. And, you know, we, we, as we know with Donald Trump, sometimes when he's joking, it's, it's actually the truth. So my guess, if I were to leave with one message tonight, it is make sure you make your plan to vote. There is absolutely zero excuse if you are eligible to vote, not to vote this year exercise your right as a citizen, echoing the great speech we just heard, and, and vote. And, and Mindy, you said something that brings me to my next question. Trump tweets, he's joked about this many times. A lot of people are concerned that if the, the results come in no, November 3rd, November 4th, and it goes towards Joe Biden, that Mr. Trump may contest. He may not want to leave the White House. That would cause a constitutional crisis in this country. What do you think Americans, everyday Americans can do, should do? What, what, what's the expectation if something like that were to occur? Yeah, I think the expectation for everyday you know, Americans is just to raise their, their voice. You know, call into radio programs, write letters to the editor, post on social media, call your representatives, um, do everything you can to, you know, kind of rise up and make a lot of noise about the, the absolute danger of a president who refuses to concede the peaceful transition of power 
is, is a hallmark of, of America and who we are as Americans. And that's what we need to see. And you know what? I have full faith that Americans will do that. I think if President Trump actually does refuse to concede, then you will have people pour into the streets in, in protest, in demonstrations, standing up for the American way, which is that we have a peaceful transition of power, no matter who you know, gets elected in any one election. Absolutely, Mindy, I agree. Thank you so much. For America to lead, we do have to get our house in order. Corruption, lies, abuses of power, they weaken us as a country while empowering and even strengthening dictators. When America lives by its principles, people around the world see the power of liberty and rise against the forces of tyranny and oppression. That's how we best honor the promise of freedom enshrined in our constitution, by living as a testament to the inherent rights and liberty for all. Sometimes it's hard to see the dangers of your current path when you're walking in it. I think that's true for a lot of American voters who aren't happy with our direction, but aren't necessarily alarmed by it. That's why I'm grateful to have our perspective of our next speaker, chess champion and champion of human rights, Gary Kasparov. He's seen how authoritarians like Putin abuse and then secure power, and he sees how frightening those similarities are within our own country. Hello, I'm Gary Kasparov. I'm happy to address the Convention on Founding Principles. The principles we are discussing here are dear to my Soviet-born heart, precisely because they represent exactly what we did not have in the Soviet Union and do not have in Russia today. Inalienable rights, the rule of law, free speech, and leaders who represent the interests of the people, not themselves. Christine. These things are what the citizens of dictatorships dream of, but these principles have powerful enemies, even in America, the nation that is supposed to embody them and uphold them. When we talk about the collapse of democracy, it evokes dramatic images. A military coup with tanks rolling through the streets, or assassinations, foreign invasions, or something else out of Hollywood. Their re reality is usually much less exciting. A slow decay. It begins when the core principles of democracy are undermined from within and are not adequately defended by those who are sworn to do so. One of the threats, and one that is often underestimated, is corruption. It is underestimated for several reasons. The word is overused and so broad as to mean just about anything. I will settle for the dictionary definition here. Dishonest or fraudulent conduct by those in power. Note that it does not necessarily have to be criminal to be corrupt. Corruption is usually well hidden, taking place behind closed doors, in private calls, meetings, and bank transfers. And it's so banal. Many find it hard to believe that such powerful people are motivated by money, not party or ideology. But time and again, from lowly functionaries to the head of state, the answer is that famous phrase, follow the money. The danger of corruption is also underestimated. But when state power is used for private gain, democracy can go off the rails very quickly. People lose faith in their government. That cynicism turns to apathy, a symptom that is often fatal. When people are disgusted by their representatives and tune out, the forces of corruption gain even more power, a vicious cycle. The crooks also realize that the institutions of democracy are a threat to their profiteering. To be safe, they must blind the watchers, remove the guardrails, fire the inspectors general, and refuse to allow access to any information that might expose them. Even the most perfectly designed checks and balances don't work if enough politicians put party and power over their oaths of office. Sound familiar? In the free world, it is still more common for rich people to get into politics than for people to get into politics to get rich. But as most of them would say, you can never be too rich. 
Individual wealth is no antidote to corruption. In nearly every autocratic state, politics are a mean of acquiring personal power and money. State power is used to enrich them, their families, and their cronies. There is no ideological preference in authoritarian corruption. Socialist dictators fill their offshore bank accounts with looted billions as eagerly as the neo-fascists. Their only motto is, let's steal together. I know, I know, politicians in democracies aren't exactly famous for being squeaky clean. There have always been the backroom deals, favors for friends and donors, and a whole infrastructure of lobbying and rent-seeking. Along with those mostly legal means, there are outright crimes, like bribery. The difference between corruption in a democracy and in authoritarian regimes is that in democracy those lawbreakers can go to jail, and often do. But we are seeing in America today transition from one type of corruption to another. From the favors and lobbying we are used to at a certain level, to the outright exploitation of public power for personal gain. Family members are appointed in positions of great power, in control of billions of dollars with little oversight by elected officials. The president himself maintains sprawling business interests around the world, opening the door both to potential outside pressure and using his vast power for personal gain. There is a huge danger here, one the Founding Fathers warned us about very clearly. They wrote frequently about the threat of conflicts of interest, one reason, by the way, that they insisted on paying the President a salary so he wouldn't be tempted to use his power for profit. The Founders had just broken away from hereditary rule, the era of kings and queens, so, they were dead set against any appearance of nepotism. Even John Adams, who was more sympathetic to the aristocracy than most of the founders, wrote in a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1813 about how much he detested hereditary owners. George Washington, who had no children of his own, also worried about corruption replacing merit in power warning in a letter about partiality for friends or relations. His lesson has largely stuck. While there are, have been a few minor political dynasties in America, it is remarkable that in the 244 years since the birth of the United States, only two parent-child combinations have ever become president. And both sons, John Quincy Adams and George W. Bush, were duly elected, not appointed. Although, both were elected in a very controversial fashion, by the way. Contrast that to the current moment when President Trump's daughter and son-in-law wield power both officially and unofficially. Story after story has come out about Jared Kushner being in charge of everything from the US-Mexico border wall to the American coronavirus response. And you can see how well both of those things have gone. Corruption isn't just petty theory, it has real consequences. Its effects are long-term and general, but also immediate and specific in our daily life and death. The founders had an answer for corrupt presidents who might abuse their power to enrich themselves or to get themselves re-elected. They called it impeachment. Unfortunately, Impeachment requires both parts of another branch of government, Congress, to do its job. And when a Senate majority decides to put the interest of party over country, it is very difficult to reign in corruption. There are also effects beyond American borders. As dictators around the world celebrate having someone who speaks their language in the Oval Office. Instead of standing up for the values of free trade, of the rule of law, of human rights, or principles of any kind, the Trump administration is only looking for a quid pro quo. And as we learned during Trump's impeachment trial, this means something in Trump's interest, 
not America's. This isn't only bad for American global leadership, but it's also bad for American business and prosperity. When corruption takes hold, everything is about who you know, not what you know or how well you can do it. This is why planned economies and corrupt dictatorships inevitably fall into economic ruin, even if they have oil and other resources. The money only goes up to the top, not to the people, not to services. America isn't there, not yet. The November 3rd election is hugely important, but it won't be the end of this fight. It must be just the beginning. As I've said, since his campaign started in 2015, Trump is a symptom of a sick system, not the disease itself. To stop him and to avoid more like him, the system must be repaired and strengthened. Transparency, disclosure, divestment, all the things the founders saw as necessary to avoid dangerous conflicts of interest. We need new laws and leaders who will apply them. Because the old honor system does not work when our officials have no honor. Corruption is rising and spreading across the world. A world that is waiting for America to come to its senses and again lead the way. But America must lead by example and cannot lead without getting its own house in order first. That means cleaning up its act and cleaning house. Beginning with the big one at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Thank you. And thank you for fighting for founding principles. Thank you so much, Gary. And I think it will behoove us all to listen to his warnings. I want to bring in Evan. And Evan, I want to get your immediate reactions to what Gary had to say. Well, thanks, Sir Michael. Honestly, I think this is such a great speech that from Gary that it should be printed out and taught in civics courses and civics classes across the country. Um, there's so much meat in here about corruption and the way dictators and aspiring dictators uh, use corruption and the chain, re the chain reaction that that causes that ends up harming so many people. Um, there's, one, there's a particular cycle of corruption that he describes uh, that I wanna step through because I think it's so instructive about the situation um, that, that we find ourselves in now as a country. He says, when state power is used for private gain, democracy can go off the rails very quickly. Let me just think about our situation. We have a president who prioritizes himself and his own interests and the interests of his family above all else, you know, whether he's, you know, simply talking about his Facebook ratings or popularity uh, or doing more serious damage like uh, you know, directing federal money and government money towards his real estate properties, his hotels, et cetera. Um, you know, that's, you know, or, or his family benefiting from, from his presidential uh, status and powers. We see that happening. We've sensed democracy going off the rails. He goes on to say, people lose, then lose faith in their government. That cynicism turns to apathy, a symptom that is often fatal. So we think about, you know, I have to say, traveling around the country before the pandemic, especially, I would hear from people all the time that, you know, I, like I can't know what's true and um, it's impossible to, to know who to trust or what to trust. And they, they're disgusted by their leaders, but they don't know what they can do about it. And so they become cynical and that turns to apathy, just like he said. And as soon as that happens, he goes on to say, when people are disgusted by their representatives and tune out, the forces of corruption gain even more power. The crooks often realize that the institutions of democracy are a threat to their, to their profiteering and to be safe, they must bind the watchers. And so you see that in this Trump administration where they're firing inspectors general, they're um, you know, purging law enforcement leaders, they're using the, they're installing a, a loyalist as the attorney general at the Department of Justice, and then using the powers of the Department of Justice to protect the president's allies and cronies and to go after uh, and to silence uh, and chill uh, the voices of, of his opposition or even those people inside the government who are just doing their jobs. But of course, that creates you know, more disgust among the American people, more apathy, 
and, and a freer hand for a corrupt, aspiring authoritarian in this case, um, to, to abuse the powers of his office. And, and it, Gary described it beautifully, but again, I think it's worth studying further. Evan, thank you so much for, for those words. Tonight, we wanna to close by honoring the life of a true American hero whose principled service to our country serves as an example to us all. Two years ago tonight, we lost Senator John McCain, but his legacy continues to be a force for good in America, as long as we remember it. I've been in my country's service since I was 17 years old. This is your name, Lieutenant Commander John McCain. I neither know nor want any other life, for I can find no greater honor than service. I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. I wasn't my own man anymore. I was my country's. The thing about John's life was the amazing sweep of it. From a tiny prison cell in Vietnam to the floor of the United States Senate. From troublemaking plebe to presidential candidate. Fight for our children's future. Fight for justice and opportunity for all. Stand up to defend our country from its enemies. Stand up for each other. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up and fight. In one epic life was written the courage and greatness of our country. It's always about basic values, John. Fairness, honesty, dignity, respect. No man, no man. He's a, he's a, he's a decent, family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with. Giving hate no safe harbor, leaving no one behind, and understanding that as Americans we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. Whatever our differences, we are fellow Americans. And please believe me when I say, no association has ever meant more to me than that. So I'll bring back in Brad and Reed. And Reed, you got some very interesting responses today. You tweeted out earlier today, what are your thoughts about John McCain? What impact did he have on you? What influence did he have on you? And I'm interested to hear what people had to say. It's amazing because the courage and the strength of John McCain inspired people from the Republican side and the Democrat side Julie tweeted, honor, loyalty, and bravery. That's what John McCain means to me. Jacob, a high school student, said he wasn't afraid to speak out, be bipartisan, and defend members of the other party to members of his party. And that's the decency of the man that we remember. And Brad, I want to get your response. What did John McCain mean to you, his, his legacy? You know, I remember John McCain as actually the first vote that I ever had as an American citizen voting for president. And the three words that I would pick, uh, honestly, would be duty, respect, uh, and honor. And I am excited to be a part of a party that is a part of that legacy. And I think that it's so important that we uh, that we pay homage uh, to that man on this on this night. You know, I, I want to share a, a personal story here. So. When I was a freshman in college, I went to Morehouse College, historically black college, and John McCain was speaking in Atlanta. I had this crazy idea, guys, of starting a college Republican chapter at the same institution that Martin Luther King graduated from the year the first African-American man was being elected to president, to the White House. And we met Senator McCain and I had the opportunity to talk with him. And I said, Senator, this is my idea. I don't know how this is gonna work. And he said, you know what? I think this is a courageous idea. I want to give you the card of my chief of staff. When we get back to Washington, you guys call me in a week or two and we'll do whatever we can to help. And guess what? I reached out and sure enough, they did every single thing they could to help us to charter that organization and get the necessary recognition uh, from the National College Republican Organization. So for me, he was just more, more than a national hero, more than an icon, but someone who took the time to help a, a freshman in college who didn't know much about the world to say, hey, I want to help empower you because I believe in you. And that's the type of man uh, Senator John McCain was. And so I, I hope we continue 
to live up to his expectations and the legacy that he laid uh, for all of us to follow. Arita, I want to go back to you and, and get some of the other comments individuals are saying on social media. Yeah, definitely. And, and first, sure, Michael, I just want to say, I hope that's the leadership that we're all inspired to follow in John McCain's and that the future Republican Party, it won't seem so odd that um, a, a college club is going to start on a campus like Morehouse. But um, <laughs> that's the legacy of the man and, and who we can all strive to be. So um, there's a lot going on on social media. Eric Trump is on stage at the RNC right now. And he said, and in America, um, there's some great comments. Americans can do anything, he says. But I'll note, that's except for visiting most other countries in the world right now. Um, so that was a funny tweet that I saw. If you're listening, um, tune in, uh, use the hashtag CFP2020 um, and join the conversation. And so, Brad, it's so interesting because it seems to me that the type of leader that John McCain was, and you think about people like Ronald Reagan, it seems those types of leaders aren't really created anymore. Do you think they're still out there? We just haven't found them yet. You know, one of the things that I have been looking for is that kind of leader. We need to be looking for leaders that can unite the American people. And while I'm quite discouraged about what I coming out of the Oval Office and uh, <laughs> quite discouragingly on Twitter day in, day out. I'm quite encouraged as I look across the American landscape and I see young people like yourself, uh, Reed, I like to throw myself in that bucket, um, but people who are looking at American ideals and saying that the best is yet to come. Um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. Is, is noted for saying that the arc of history bends towards justice. And I'd like to think that the arc of history also bends towards freedom. Uh, it also bends towards the respect of the individual and, and respect for human dignity. And I think that uh, America is leading the charge for that. And so I'm encouraged as I look at all the people joining us on the live stream, as I look at all the tweets and responses that I'm getting throughout the night and throughout the day that I'm really appreciative of them. And I'm looking forward to the next great generation of American leaders. And I think that it starts with movements like these tonight. And, and Reed, when we think about John McCain and you think about someone like Donald Trump, Donald Trump is a liar. He's a con man. He continuously misleads people on purpose for his own personal gain. That was not the type of person John McCain was. How in the world do you think the Republican Party went from a John McCain to a Donald Trump? You know what? It is a lack of courage among leaders. When Donald Trump was gaining steam in the primary, we could have had folks like Speaker Paul Ryan speak out, and they didn't. But here's what gives me hope, Sher Michael. It's not just all the speakers that we've seen at this convention or the delegates chiming in online, but it's a real focus among our generation, the next generation, that conservatism needs to speak to opportunity. Our country is not great because of our government, but because of the creativity, ingenuity, and charity of our people. And an opportunity agenda, which we're gonna set forward from this moment on, um, breaks down the barriers that hold Americans back so they can do the hard work of building up our country. And Reed, I wanna ask you really quickly, what type of an example do you think Donald Trump's despicable behavior displays for America's children and the future. Well, you know, I want to answer this by talking about a personal story. Last year, um, I was in a cafeteria with a friend and her eight-year-old daughter was with us. And she overheard someone around us talking about Donald Trump. And this little girl turned to me and said, Donald Trump, he calls girls fat pigs. This is an eight-year-old girl. Our kids are listening, so we need to do better. And this is not who we are as Republicans or Americans. And, and Brad, you've talked many times about being a father, being a dad. I ask you that same question. Again, what type of example does this man set? Uh, I, I, I'd have to echo Reed on this one, and it, it, it's not a positive one. Uh, but one of the things that I am encouraged by is that he's not the only example that's out there. Uh, he might have the platform, he might have the microphone, but I think that it takes principled individuals like the ones that we've seen giving speeches uh, last night and tonight to stand up and actually articulate what true American values, what true American ideals and principles are to keep us moving on the right path. I want to thank both Brad and Reed for those absolutely amazing remarks on the late Senator John McCain. 
Up next, our next speaker is Catherine Gale, a business leader and author who believes free market political reforms are, are needed in order to fix our fractured republic. Hello, I'm Catherine Gale, founder of the name? Institute for Political Innovation, and before that, CEO of a Wisconsin oh, high-tech okay. dairy company about 20 miles from this farm. Convention speeches are easy hey, venues hey, for I'm politicians to declare that America's best days are just ahead of us, despite evidence to the contrary for far too many Americans. I'm not a politician. I was recently asked whether our best days are ahead of us, and yes, there absolutely is a road to best days ahead. But that's not the road we're on. And no matter who wins on November 3rd, we won't be on that road. I'm not saying November 3rd isn't consequential. It is. But I will tell anyone, regardless of the side they're on, the same thing. No matter who is elected president on November 3rd, we won't be on a trajectory to our very brightest days ahead. Because on November 4th, the political system that's breaking our republic, that's breaking us in two, will remain. It's easy not to really see it, this political system that surrounds us. We think it's normal that bipartisan action in Congress only occurs when there's a crisis and both sides agree to pass the cost to future generations. We think it's normal that campaign finance rules let you donate $3.2 million to Republicans and Democrats during any two-year election cycle, but only $5,400 to a congressional candidate running as an independent. We think it's normal that researchers examining congressional action on over 1,000 policy issues found, and I quote, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. We think it's normal to have only two choices when we vote. We think it's normal not to like our choices. It seems normal because it's usual. This is no way to run our country. We are free to change it. It's our choice. Our habit is to look to new leaders for change. Let's compare the rules of politics to the rules in our lives. If we don't do our jobs well, we'll lose them. If companies don't serve their customers well, those customers will simply take their business to a different company that's doing a better job. So why is the political industrial complex bigger, richer, and more powerful than ever while Americans have never been more dissatisfied? Because under the rules of the game in politics, the only thing each party has to do to win is convince the average voter to choose them as the lesser of two evils. The one thing neither party needs to do to win is deliver results for the citizens, results in the public interest writ large. Why? Because the voter only has two choices. And no matter how dissatisfied you are, you still likely prefer what your side claims to stand for than what the one other side says they're for. In any industry as powerful and as lucrative as the politics industry, with this much customer dissatisfaction in only two companies, some enterprising American would see it as a phenomenal business opportunity and create a new competitor to give the customer what they want. But that doesn't happen in politics because the two parties this duopoly, work very well together behind the scenes in one particular way, to rig the rules of the game to protect themselves jointly from new competition. Our politics isn't broken, it's fixed. To be clear, I don't believe our problems are caused by the conservatives or the liberals or the existence of parties or even having just two parties with any power. The problem is that the current two are guaranteed to remain the only two, regardless of what they do or don't do on behalf of our country. 
And senators and representatives are, many of them, as much a prisoner of the dysfunctional system as we are. Their only option is lockstep allegiance to their side. In the land of the free, they don't even have the freedom to work across the aisle, to find together the best way forward. That, my fellow Americans, is profoundly un-American. And yet, most of us are still in love, in love with America, with being American, with the possibility of these United States of America, imperfect yet striving. What should we do with this love of our breaking country? Let's put it to work. In 1854, when neither the Whigs nor the Democrats were addressing the sin of slavery, a small group of Americans who knew what needed to be done didn't resolve to take over or take back or burn down either of the two broken parties. They instead took the most American of roads, a new one. 75 miles from here in a one-room schoolhouse in Ripon, Wisconsin, they founded the Republican Party. Maybe that's your road, leaving this convention. But whatever direction you ultimately choose, I invite you to start with the system, to make sure the bedrock of our democracy on which you build is healthy, strong. Let's make sure your vision and the principled visions of others have a fighting chance to make their case to the American people and deliver on their promises. To achieve that, we must change our dysfunctional election system, which brings us right to founding principles, to our Constitution. Article 1 gives each state the power to make all the rules about their state's congressional elections. Let's use that power to solve our problem. Let's change the rules of how we vote, by implementing a system called Final Five Voting. Final Five Voting is a combination of open top five primaries and ranked choice voting general elections. Under this system, party primaries will no longer create a proverbial eye of the needle through which no problem-solving politician could ever hope to pass. Voters for new challengers and new ideas won't waste their votes or spoil the election. And the general election will be more important than the primary as it should be. Change the rules of how we vote, thus change the incentives and change the results we get from Washington, D.C. I like to call it free market politics, delivering the best of what healthy free markets promise, innovation, results, and accountability. That's why the competition in Final Five voting isn't designed to ask conservatives or liberals to abandon their ideas or principles it isn't designed to necessarily even change who wins. It's designed to change what the winners are incented to do, to make solving problems and delivering results for the people the surest road to re-election. America was founded on the greatest political innovation of modern times, and political innovation is once again the key to our future. Let's take the power the Constitution gives us change how we vote for Congress, and start down that road to America's brightest days ahead for all Americans, coast to coast. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine Gale. And thanks again for joining us on night two of the Convention on Founding Principles. We were honored to have so many speakers standing up for a government for the people, of the people, and by the people. The power truly is in our hands, and with it, we have the responsibility to fight against the things we know are wrong and fight for the things we know are right. Be sure to join us tomorrow for day three, a shining city on the hill. Our speakers will tell us how American leadership starts at home by standing up for the values that make us a beacon of liberty. We'll hear from Miles Taylor, who left his job at Homeland Security to speak out about President Trump's abuses of power and disdain for immigrants. We'll also have former Commerce Secretary Carlos Gutierrez, S.C. Cup, former Congressman Charlie Dent, Dan Barkov, and Anthony Scaramucci. You don't want to miss it. Be sure to share your thoughts by using the hashtag CFP2020 and tell your friends to join us again tomorrow night. Thanks for watching and God bless.